Okay, everyone, welcome back to the Monero Village. We are start, uh, starting our next talk with Francisco Cabanas from uh, the Monero Core team. He goes by Arctic Mine. He'll be talking about the block reward in Monero and what happens in a few years. So please, let's quiet down in the back and let's give our attention to Francisco. Thanks. In Monero, but also how it relates to a lot of the other coins, and, I, and I'm talking specifically about Bitcoin-like coins and also uh, coins such as other uh, crypto note coins, and what happens when this thing goes to zero, and what are the risks? So this is kind of an overview. I will do a review of fee and block weight scaling in Monero. Now, this is quite unique to Monero. And it's very different from what people are used to. If you, for example, you're used to fees in Bitcoin, and it's also quite subtle. Um, and for this reason, I will spend some time in it and how it relates to the penalty, etc. My next topic will be the, the rational miner. What is, what is a rational miner in Monero and how does a fee market in Monero actually work? What, what is the block reward goes to zero? I mean, this is um, a very interesting question o overall, and it also, what kind of limits do we have? I mean, it's mission good enough. Um, implications for Monero, Monero-like adaptive block, block weights, and also implications for Bitcoin and Bitcoin-like small and large block weights and the Satoshi fee market. So this is an overview of fees in, in scaling review in Monero. There are some significant changes from the last time I spoke on this in, uh, here at DEF CON in, in, in 2018. There has been some changes, so I'm going to cover those for the sake of completeness or understanding how this process works. Fee, the Monero uses what's called a crypto note, who used to be the crypto note, now I'm going to refer to it as the Monero penalty. And what essentially the Monero penalty does is it actually takes the, let me see, I can show you this here. It takes the base reward and it penalizes um, essentially the percentage increase in the, in the block size over the median squared. So when you mine a block that is larger than the medium over the last 100 blocks, um, you will pay a penalty essentially forfeiting part of your block reward if you're a miner. And this is the driving force for how fees work in Monero. This is the driving force for how scaling works in Monero. Now, a couple of the changes is we, uh, the median is actually capped temporarily, so there's actually two medians. One is over 100 blocks and one is over 100,000 blocks. And this is primarily to ensure that certain types of attacks cannot work in Monero. Those changes were put in place this year in the last hard fork, so it's actually very recent. Um, and this is why I will spend a bit more time covering this because it has been some changes. Okay, so what do we have here? We've got the base reward, which is basically your block reward. And then we have the reward that's paid to the miner, and essentially what you're doing is you taking out this penalty. And then you say maximum allowed block, uh, total block weight is twice, and essentially when you give up the entire block reward. So what happens is if you make um, MB, which is the, uh, a, a, MB is twice MN, then you basically end up with on you equals zero, and you've given up your entire block reward as penalty. And what you've done if you mined a, a block that's twice the size of the median. The penalties only apply when you mine a larger block and you do not get a rebate for mining a smaller block. This is very important. And so the change that we introduced in, was introduced this year in, uh, in the spring of this year was that we're capping the median as 50 times the long-term medium, which is 100,000 uh, 100, blocks. 
and then it has to scale at a much lower scale rate uh, in order to prevent sort of out of control, out of bounds scaling. So for simplicity, I will define B as this ratio, which is essentially a percentage increase in the in the block that you mine, and the penalty becomes R B times B, well, B squared. So basically, the square of uh, B times R is your penalty, and you can think of it as the percentage increase in the block weight. Okay, so now we have what happens when we add a transaction. So let's say that we already have a series of transactions, and we add an additional transaction, and we're somewhere in the penalty, and we look at what is the incremental penalty from adding that transaction. Well, it's a fairly straightforward quadratic equation. You just expand it out, and what you get is 2B, BT. Now, B is the increased block size percentage before adding the transaction, BT is the, the transaction size. So that is the key parameter that a miner has to deal with when she's looking at adding a transaction. Okay, if I'm gonna add this transaction, how much is it gonna cost me? And then the question becomes, how much fee do I get from the transaction in return? And, and that is the, the, the essence of what a miner has to deal with in this situation. So there's a couple of things that are done. Uh, one of them actually is, is that we have to define certain uh, fee structures. And one of them is that we have to look at, okay, do we have enough space in the fees? So if you take a typical transaction at the, at the, minimum, um, at the minimum block weight of 300,000 bytes, can we actually scale it? So is there enough there in fees for a miner to actually be able to add this transaction on? And that effectively is what sets the normal fee in Monero. Now, going back a minute to Reha's talk, this is a question of sort of, why don't you just take a higher fee? And the answer is people don't. And in fact, at one point in the past, people weren't doing that, and the, and the blocks were just getting stuck. Because nobody was clicking on, on, on an interface and simply adding the next level fee that would have done the, solve the problem. So, so this is part of the simplicity of design from the back end. Um, element. So this is why we have we set the normal fee at this point. Uh, essentially, we're setting at the optimal level to add one transaction just at the penalty. Okay. So and then there's a low fee and high fee that are set. The key difference also from last uh, yes, year is that we're basing the fees now on the long-term median as opposed to the short-term median. So basically, here's the interesting: the highest fee per byte. The maximum, if you max the whole thing out, is actually twice the entire reward, uh, and then, so it's a very high per B, twice our beta or ML, and then you get the, all the other fees that we pay. Okay, so the changes were the introduction of, of the long-term median, capping the growth of 50 times, uh, the, of the short-term median of 50 times X. The long-term medium only grows for 1.4 times, so it's restricted, it's equivalent to keeping it restricted, effectively controls the rate of growth of the block size uh, over time to prevent certain types of attacks. So this is kind of my review. The implication is basically that we are limiting this to prevent these to prevent attacks. So now we're taking a close look at the rational miner. So what is a rational miner? Is the rational miner is neither altruistic nor malicious and acts in her enlightened self-interest. She's also dealing with rational users who wish to pay the lowest fee to get their transactions mined. This is the basic dynamic of a fee market in Monero. You have the miner, you have the users, and you have the penalty. And essentially, the users are competing against the penalty in order to get their transactions mined. So the problem. You're a rational miner. The problem is, given a finite number, I got all these transactions in the transaction pool, I have a distribution of weights and fees. What is the optimal set of transactions in a block in order to maximize the return to the miner? And this is not, this is a, essentially what's called a discrete optimization problem. You can actually solve it exactly. But there's also a relatively simple approximation that is pretty close to where you want to be, but not 100%, which I'm going to go over, which kind of explains it a lot more efficiently. 
So you make an approximation, and the approximation that we make is that the transactions are small compared to the block size. So you order the transactions in fee per byte. Okay? You add them to the block starting with the highest transaction first. And the idea there is you take the highest paying transactions and you give them priority, the most profitable one. Then you test that at each transaction for profit. And then you test, once you get into the penalty, then you look at it, okay, I add an extra transaction, do I get, I get a fee, does it attract more penalty than that fee? If the answer is yes, then you stop. If the answer is no, then you keep adding transactions. And of course, if you run out of transactions with or without penalty, then that's fine also. So what the rational miner does is take the best, highest paying transactions, gives them priority, and then works her way right up until they get a point where it's no longer profitable to add more transactions. So basically, the penalty level is determined by the lowest paying fee transaction. And this is a critical point. All the transactions that are below are actually paying a higher fee per byte because the miner's already given the priority. So this effectively creates, every time the penalty is triggered, a profit for the miner. The miner makes a profit on the transactions because they need to get ahead of the penalty. So they have to pay this so that the miner will include them. But the miner gives priority to the highest paying transaction. So the rational users basically got to figure out well, where in the penalty do I want to be? And then ask the question, okay, this is how much I'm willing to pay, and this is how much I'm willing to push the penalty to get my transaction mined. That's the decision the rational user does, and then it offers that penalty as a fee. Okay, now, here's a key element of all of this. The total fees that are collected are proportional to the block reward, because what's driving it is the penalty, which is a portion of the block reward. That is what's constraining the size and growth of the block size. So here's the interesting fun part. What happens when the block reward goes to zero? And the answer is really quite simple. So do the fees. Because the penalty is zero. So now, if you drive the, the, the block reward to zero, you get no fees. And how do you incentivize the miner? Okay, we may have a problem here. Essentially, there are two scenarios. One of them is that the miners try to form a cartel to protect themselves. And they go ahead and they try to protect fees. Cartels have historically been found to fail because people cheat. And so that is not a particularly stable. The more likely the overall scenario is simply the whole thing collapses. The, the, the base goes to zero. The total fleet goes to zero. You have a tragedy of the commons because of competition among miners. And here's a really interesting part. You have no incentive to secure the network. And that's scary because now you, you, you have no security, none. Okay, so how does Monero deal with this? Well, what Monero actually does is it sidesteps the whole thing. It simply says, we're not going to allow the block reward to go to zero. And then that is, makes it, actually, the point of this talk, not a particularly interesting point, because actually Monero solved the problem by simply sidestepping it. And this is why it's so critical to have this minimum tail emission of block reward. Because without it, you will not have the scaling in Monero. And in fact, as I will discuss later, you have serious problems with some of the other scaling ideas that have been put in place. So I'm going to deal with it first with one coin, which is a bit interesting uh, in the history of Monero, and that's Bitcoin. People might have known Bitcoin as a heavily pre-mined scam, because over 83% was either a pre-mine or, or an insta-mine. It was launched just about the same time, just before Monero. And actually, Monero was forked from Bitcoin. And there was a crypto note reference. One of the key differences that Bitcoin did that Monero didn't have is that Bitcoin doesn't have a tail emission. It followed the Bitcoin model of allowing it to, to smoothly go to zero. 
And because he tried to set up this pre-mine, Nina mine thing, and make it look like a Nina mine over two years, so it was 2012 to 2014, and they wanted 83 percent, so they had to decay the total block by 83 percent in two years. You have this really, really fast falling um, reward curve, which makes it the perfect canary in the, in the gold mine to look at this problem of fees. And so you look at it, and you say, okay, we have the block reward went to about 808 uh, BCN. Now, if you actually look at the code, the, there's a 10,000 factor between bytecode and Monero, um, which is sort of rough comparable to 0 0.08 XMR per block. So that's roughly the, the comparison. And this then is about 12% uh, of Monero's tail emission. They still have a falling block reward because there's a really fast block reward. They panicked. They had to do something. Otherwise, they're going to become insecure. So they said, OK, fine. Let's have the miners boat on the medium, effectively trying to set up where it's going to look like a minor cartel. A little more interesting history in Bitcoin is uh, there was an ASIC, a bunch of ASICs were mining Monero. There were forked off the network. Um, and these, last year, actually, and these ASICs ended up in, in, in Bitcoin under primarily the control of Bitmain. So essentially, what we have is a minor cartel in Bitcoin. And then what we're likely going to have is sooner or later, the ASICs are going to run out. The block reward is still going down fast to zero. There are hardly any transactions. And nobody's going to bother building new ones. And the thing might just go into tragedy of the commons. So now we talk about the big boys, uh, Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin originally introduced the one megabyte block size in 2010. And this is why one criticism that I do have of the Satoshi paper. It says, the incentive can also be funded with transaction fees. Yeah, fine. If the original value of a transaction is less than the input value, the difference of the, is a transaction fee that is added to the incentive of the block containing the transaction. Once a predetermined number of coins is has entered circulation, the incentive can transition entirely to transaction fees and be completely inflation free. This is a straight quote from Satoshi, Nakamoto, Bitcoin, PRP, etc. My opinion on this is very simple. The fact that you include a statement in what is otherwise a work of genius does not make the statement true. There is no justification whatsoever for this statement. No theory, no references, what is the game theory? How is this supposed to work? None. What happened is about 20 months later, 2010, the one megabyte block size was, in, was introduced in a hard fork in Bitcoin. That's what actually happened. And it was actually introduced by Satoshi. And, a, and then the birth of the block size debate in Bitcoin started. Very interesting. So. What has happened? Well, you have this maximum number of the, this limitation. And one of the interesting results is that from Monero is, well, OK, so if we're going to have the Satoshi fee market, whatever penalty we're going to have, whatever price to increase the block size, it better be stiffer than what Monero has, because we've already shown that Monero goes to zero so without a block reward. So we need something that's harder. We need something that's stiffer. And well, what better than just a fixed block size, which is essentially what Bitcoin code has done. But this, of course, creates a problem that you, you can't scale the coin. And Bitcoin essentially failed as a transaction of currency, mostly failed. I mean, you can still use it for large amounts. It's still cost effective to do that. And in fact, I've done it, and I do it regular, on a very regular basis. But it is not particularly effective for small transactions, because the fees are too high. And so it's been transitioned as a store of value, which has been a major, I mean, I consider that a major success of the Bitcoin community, because they managed to save the value of Bitcoin. But, so there's great response in that regard. But basically, because of this security issue, the only prudent response from Bitcoin Coach is basically to leave the me one megabyte thing in place, at least until you can show that you can actually generate this Satoshi fee money. Having said that, there is still potential attacks. And one of them that I considered is what happens on Christmas Day. Well, on Christmas Day, you, know, you have all the high shopping, and all of a sudden, Nobody's chopping, nobody's transacting, nothing's happening in the network. So if you have a fee-based solution, 
if you want to attack the coin, then that is when I want to do it. So I looked at, if you're going to attack a coin that's just based on fees, the day to do it is Christmas Day. So you get to play Scrooge. So I call it the Scrooge attack. So that's interesting in Bitcoin. Now, if you look at Bitcoin AC, they just took off the limits entirely. So there what they did is, well, they have an effectively infinite site. But wait a minute, you have an infinite block size. How are we restricting this? Uh, nothing. And then they go and say, well, okay, there's no limit uh, on, on the size. Well, he has to question how this fee market is going to develop. I did a, a rough uh, estimate, and it'd be roughly about 8.8% uh, of the block reward in uh, 2043, which is basically the 200th anniversary of uh, Charles Dick and uh, uh, Christmas Cow. It was published in, in 1843. And, and we're not talking 2143. So we're talking something within our lifetime. So this is, and they're already very, very low. So that begs the question, how? Um, and where you end up getting is there's a lot of questions and very few answers. And some people might say minimum fees, and I, I should backtrack on that on our previous slides. Minimum fees do not prevent the miners from giving out-of-bound rebates. So that's not a solution. Because a miner can basically say, OK, I'm going to rebate you back if you submit the transaction directly to my site. So that's not really the answer. So what you end up with is lots of questions and very few answers. So my conclusion, the Monero emission, uh, tail emission, is absolutely vital. Uh, it actually makes Monero work. And it may be very close to optimal because of the amount versus the fact that it's less than the um, the inflation rate of gold, which is considered hard money. So you have the hard money argument sort of handled. The Satoshi fee market is totally unproven. It may not even work at all. We don't know. I mean, the best chance is in Bitcoin, if they manage by keeping the block size small, that they may be able to make it work. We don't know the answer. There's no evidence for this. There's a lot of evidence for, for a cryptocurrency working with a block rule. We have 10 years of evidence in Bitcoin for that. But we don't have evidence for this Satoshi fee market. And basically what you get, if you got maximum number of coins on other block rewards, you've got more questions than real answers. So at this point in time, I'm ready to take some questions, if anybody has questions or discussion. Any questions? Yes. Well, I mean, the price that you pay is that you have a linear inflation, which is less than the historical inflation rate of gold. And that's the argument, that's the hard money argument. I mean, the, the, that, is the, that is what scares people, because a lot of people love the idea of the finite number of coins. It's very saleable. But what you end up with is you're still harder than gold. And if you're going to go for the gold standard of hard money or Austrian money, which is essentially what we're trying to say here, the implication is, well, if you can beat gold, you're OK. Um, the other thing is, because it's linear and it's not exponential, you actually might get a situation where you get a stable a stability between the total number of coins, lost coins, and the inflation rate. So you, what you end up actually very likely is some kind of equilibrium between price, lost coins, and the inflation rate. So you'll actually end up with exactly a flat amount of coins. But that you still have that bound by the inflation rate of gold. So as long as you're ahead of gold, you're harder money than gold, then you're okay. Which is kind of the argument that, that one can make. Any more questions? Yes? You said on the block, uh, what's the zero? Is that something that's Well, unless you have a penalty or a cost of increasing the block size that is stiffer than Monero. Because if you show in Monero that this is what happened, you need a stiffer penalty, a stiffer cost of increasing the block size for the fees to go to zero. So for example, Bitcoin Core is done. It says, well, we're, not, we're going to keep the block size at one megabyte. Well, that is definitely an infinite penalty. So it could work there. 
But then you'd get someone like say Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, we're gonna let this thing grow to infinity. They just mined a 210 megabyte block. Well, that is way weaker than what Monero has. So you have a bound. You have a bound saying, if it's stronger, the penalty is weaker than what's in Monero, then the fees are gonna to go to zero. That's essentially the, the thesis. Well, there is nothing to restrain that block size. There is nothing to create scarcity. So either you go back to the Bitcoin scenario, either you have a mining cartel, or you get a tragedy of the commons, or what could probably happen, you first get a mining cartel, and then you get a tragedy of the commons. Any more questions? Any more questions? Still got about two minutes left. Okay, well, thank you.